thank you for coming to this lecture and thank you for being part of this uh, uh, all day learnathon at Graz and uh, this day of giving at Graz. Um, let me say, well, let me actually first share my screen. Okay, share. There we go. So let me first say that uh, if you have any questions, if you have any anything you want to discuss or any comments you want to send me, you want to talk to me about, um, you can shoot me an email or you can even call me on the phone. It's fine. Uh, I would be, uh, I would love to speak to anybody who wants to uh, wants to give me a call or to uh, discuss anything with anybody who wants to send me an email. Um, and my email and my phone are there on the screen, but they're also on the Gratz website. I'm not hard to get hold of. Um, And I started out in the the other part of the video um, when I was in the library. Uh, I started out with uh, with Ben Yehuda's dictionary, um, but uh, I'm actually going to be talking about five different uh, books. I'll get to Ben Yehuda eventually, but uh, but first I want to uh, talk about um, about several other books. And uh, I'm going to call these treasures of the Gratz College Library. I'll talk more about that later. Um, I think they are indeed treasures. Um, and I think that together, and I picked them out of all of the books, you know, at Gratz that I've, you know, that I've seen or that I've looked at, um, because I think that together they tell this, a very remarkable story, the story of one of the greatest achievements of the Jewish people in the modern era, which is the revival of Hebrew language, the uh, the rebirth of Hebrew, the creation of uh, of of Hebrew as as a modern language, as a language of secular literature, uh, as a language of everyday life, as a spoken language. Um, I'm going to call these revolutions, right? I think it was a linguistic revolution that really took place. Took place in several stages over, over over a long period, from a sacred language to a secular language, from an ancient language to a modern language, from a written language to a spoken language, as it is in Israel today. Okay, but I want to start at the beginning, before all of these changes, before this linguistic revolution. Um, what was like? What was Hebrew like before that? And, and sometimes people say um, that it was a dead language, and, and I, I'm not sure that I would. That I would say that was an everyday use. Um, Jews used Hebrew every day, but it was a sacred language. They used it <clears throat> for mainly, not absolutely exclusively, but 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 almost exclusively. They used it for Jewish rituals, for religious purposes. Um, they said their prayers in Hebrew. They uh, read the Torah in the synagogue in Hebrew. Um, uh, Hebrew was an ancient language, it was the language of the ancient prayers, and of course it was the language of the Bible. Um, so, Gratz Library has many, many Hebrew books that are religious books and they're sacred books, um, and that uh, are, are, are part of this use of Hebrew as a, uh, as a sacred language. Um, older books and, and, and more recent books, this one I think is, has, has a special story. Um, this is uh, David Levy's Hebrew English uh, Torah, <clears throat> Torah translation. Um, and it was published in London in, eight, in 17, I'm sorry, in 1787. Um, David Levy was the first Jew to translate any part of the Bible into English. He was an interesting character actually. He uh, he started out as a hat maker, um, and then he got and uh, moved into the printing into the printing trade, um, and uh, and he and he published. This was a clever idea, right? A Hebrew English chumash, uh, a, a Torah for to to read in the synagogue, uh, in the pews while they're reading the Torah scroll out in front. Um, it's the great granddaddy of, uh, of you know all of the uh, the Hebrew English. Torah translations that people use in, in synagogue today, like the Hertzkumash and all the others. Um, and uh, 
uh, this book um, is a historic one in its own right. As I said, the first first Jewish translation of uh, English translation of the uh, of the Torah, um, but it also has a deep connection to the history of Gratz. Um, it was a gift from the Gratz family themselves, um, from uh, Miss Rachel Gratz Nathan. Uh, that's not a picture of Rachel. That's that's Rachel's great aunt. That's that's Rebecca Gratz in the picture on, on the screen. Um, but it was her great niece, um, great niece of, of Hyman Gratz, who founded uh, Gratz College and Rebecca Gratz. Um, and it was one of the first books that was given to Gratz College after we opened. Um, so, um, very shortly after we opened, we started the library. And very shortly after they started the library, came along Miss uh, Miss Nathan and gave us uh, these six volumes of the uh, uh, of, of the David Levy uh, Chumash, which is five volumes uh, for each of the five books of the Torah, and, and then one volume of the five Megillah, which are read on, on the holidays. Um, it's a beautiful little book. Um, so the next book also that I want to speak about also has, has a connection with Kratz. Um, which is that, that this, at the same time, again, Gratz opened in 1895, the library started the next year or maybe in, 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 in 97. Um, by 1903, so just a few years later, uh, Gratz began to teach modern Hebrew literature. Um, and the text that they were using, uh, they, they were reading in class, was, uh, was this book, it was uh, Ahavat Sion, um, the Love of Zion, uh, a novel. Uh, the author was a Lithuanian Jew, a Litvak, um, named Avraham Mapu, odd name, um, and, but a considerable writer. Um, and it's a uh, it's a love story. It's a romance. The title kind of suggests that, um, and it takes place in Zion, uh, that is to say, in biblical Jerusalem, um, in Jerusalem in the time of prophet Isaiah, actually. Um, and as I said, it was the first modern Hebrew text that was studied at Gratz. Um, so it has a connection to Gratz history, but it also has a, it's an important, marks an important step in the history of Hebrew as a language. Avat Sion was the first Hebrew novel. Um, before it, there were stories, there were narrative poems, there were all kinds of uh, ways of, of telling stories, but there, but but Avatzion was the first Hebrew novel, in fact. Um, and as I said, in 1903, the Gratz uh, College faculty chose it when they decided that they were going to teach Hebrew uh, as a secular language and not just as a sacred language, right? And as a modern language and not just as an ancient language. Um, which brings us to Herzl. Um, same year that Gratz opened its doors, 1897. Um, Herzl was very busy um, laying the foundations for the uh, Zionist movement. And somebody asked him, this is how the story goes, uh, somebody asked him, Dr. Herzl, when you have created the Zionist utopia, um, when you have you know, founded the, Zion, the, the, the Jewish state, what language are they going to speak there? Um, are they going to speak Hebrew? And Herzl, Herzl no, knew virtually no Hebrew. He, I mean, he had studied Herzl, he had studied uh, Hebrew in, in religious school when he was a, you know, when he was a little boy. Um, but 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 he wasn't he he wasn't he wasn't knowledgeable in Hebrew. And uh, you know, in the Jewish way, he answered a question with a question. Question. Um, and he said, well, can you buy a train ticket in Hebrew? Meaning, Hebrew may be a great language for prayers. It's possibly a very fine language if we want to write a historical novel that's set in the time of the Bible. Sure, what up? Um, but it's not a language that's suited for modern life. Um, it's not, it, what's Hebrew for train? Thing is this, um, by 1897, 
you could absolutely buy a train ticket in Hebrew. If you could find somebody who was willing to sell you a train ticket and who happened to know Hebrew. Um, but the words were there. There wasn't any problem about the language. Um, and and all of the people who were involved in Hebrew, so all the Hebrew teachers and all of the uh, Hebrew writers and all the Hebrew publishers and editors and all of these people, they all, they all knew this. They'd all been working on this for like 30, 40 years at this stage. They've been working on this exact problem uh, of how to make Hebrew into a language suitable for modern life. Um, uh, and and you know again by by the 1890s there were there were daily newspapers coming out in Hebrew reporting the news in Hebrew each day in Warsaw and in Saint Petersburg there were two. Rain is what Um right? There were words. There's a word for buying stuff in Hebrew. Uh, that's not a problem. There's 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 a word for a ticket. They didn't but right? they they'd solved all of these linguistic problems. Herzl didn't happen to know this. Or if he did know it, he was ignoring it, which was, again, kind of annoying of it. Um, but they'd done it. Um, and the person who had invented this new word, Vakevet, train, that was Eliezer ben Yehuda. Um, but I'm going to put off ben Yehuda just for another minute or two. Um, ben Yehuda was a would become a famous writer. He's famous at least in Israel now. There's a street named after him in uh, in Tel Aviv. There's a street named after him also in uh, in downtown Jerusalem. <laughs> Some of you might remember it's where Richie's Pizza used to be. Um, you were ever there in uh, in Kikar Tzion. Anyway. Um, He's famous in Israel. Um, our next author, Moses Marcus Philip, is not famous at all, and his book isn't famous at all. And also, let me add, uh, that it isn't worth any money at all. Um, I mean, if you tried to sell it, you know, it would, it would be worth less than, I don't know, it'd be worth less than dirt. Um, I mean, literally, you know, if, if you want to buy dirt, right, you know, a nice bag of dirt, you go into the dirt store, right? You go into the gardening store, right? Um, and about a bag of dirt costs, costs you, runs you like uh, $5, $10, I don't know. Um, you couldn't get $10 for this book if you put it up for auction. I don't think you could get five. I don't think you can get a penny. I don't think anyone would buy it at all. There just isn't any market for this kind of book, uh, for this kind of old Hebrew book from the 1800s. Um, no market whatsoever. Nevertheless, I think it's a treasure. I think we should keep it. Um, I think rats should keep it, honestly. Um, I snuck it into the rare book room. It is actually somewhat rare. Uh, I put it. I put it in the rare book room. Don't tell anybody. Um, just so we would keep it. Of course, I'll get back to Moses Philip in, in a second. But um, a, a treasure isn't just something that you that, that you sell for a lot of money, right? A treasure is something that you want to keep. Um, it's the opposite of that, right? It's something you want to hold on to. I think we should hold on to this book because I think it um, uh, it uh, it marks a, an important point in the development of Hebrew. Again, right? It's part of the story of of the revival of Hebrew. Um, Moses Philip was a Jew who lived in Romania, and in 1822 um, he published this book in Lviv, which is now in Ukraine, and. Uh, and he wanted to write a book about electrical appliances and about the telegraph. And that, that was easy. Um, and he wanted to do it in Hebrew. That was hard. 1882, that was hard. Again, because the, the same problem that, that, that Herzl was talking about, words, words. What's the word for telegraph? Um, what's the word for electricity? Um, and Philip's solution to this, which was was to, uh, was to use a lot of Loan words, um, like in the title. The title is "Kli Hat Telegraph uh, Uma Asehu," and and uh, and ha "Telegraph," as you might possibly have guessed, uh, means uh, the telegraph, right? Or throughout the book, right? He's, he keeps talking about electricity, and electricity, again, as as you know, seems pretty obvious, um, is electricity. 
Um, and in general, if, if Phillips doesn't happen to have a word that he knows in Hebrew, then he fills in with a loan word from one of the European languages. Which brings me to El, our hero, Eliezer Ben Yehuda. Ben Yehuda became famous because he rejected this procedure. He rejected what Philip and these other authors were doing. Um, he refused to use loan words. Uh, he wanted to use only Hebrew words, he, roots with uh, words with Hebrew roots. Um, and he was also a Lithuanian Jew, like like Mapu, and he had moved to uh, Jerusalem in 1882, um, in the same year when uh, when Philip was publishing his book. Eli uh, Eliezer Ben Yehuda moves to Jerusalem and he began his project, was, which was to make up hundreds of Hebrew words for, for all of the things that you need to talk about in the modern world. And he made, made up uh, some words which are you know, still part of the everyday language in Israel, ice cream, right, is klida. Um, a train is, is a rakevet. Uh, he made up also a word for a dictionary. He was writing a dictionary and he made up a word for a dictionary. That's milon. Um, made them up, he coined them, right? Uh, and they're based on, on earlier Hebrew words, words in the Bible, but, but, they're, but they're new, right? A rochev in the Bible is somebody who rides on a horse. A rakevet is now a train. Um, Mila is a word, milon is a dictionary. Um, and so on. Um, and I call him the father of, of, of modern Hebrew. I mean, the fact is, he cannot speak modern Hebrew, um, can't speak it at all without using Ben Yehuda's thousand, uh, hundreds of words, and possibly as many as a thousand words that he made up. Um, not loan words, not ancient words, but modern, modern words, modern Hebrew words created by Ben Yehuda and, and then by a whole a slew of uh, of other authors and writers and uh, and and people who speak Hebrew who who make up new words all the time, um, down to the present day. Um, if you follow like on Hebrew Twitter, which is a lot of fun, um, Hebrew Twitter is is constantly like, just making up new words. Um, they're very you know they're very creative. It's a living language. Which brings us finally to the dictionary. Um, stories like this. By 1909, so he had been living in Israel at that point for about 20 years, living in Palestine. Um, ben Yehuda had been busy, busy making up all of these new words, he and his whole group. And they figured that they were about done. That is, um, they thought that Hebrew now had a word for everything. They'd solved Herzl's problem. It wasn't just a word for train, that was a word for anything. If you could say it in Russian, if you could say it in German, you could say it in Hebrew. Um, they'd been through the entire dictionary, right? And, and said, okay, this word in, in German, We've got a word for it. This word in Russian, we've got a word for it. every tree, every kind of plant, everything. Um, electricity, chashmal, right? Good biblical word which they repurposed um, to mean electricity. Um, dictionary, milon, and, and so on. Um, and Ben Yehudis started working with a huge project to put all of the words in Hebrew, all the ancient words, all the medieval words, all the modern words, all the words he had made up, all the words everybody else had made up into a dictionary, um, the great dictionary of the Hebrew language, ancient and modern. But he also wanted to do something else. And, it, and, it, and, and no, you, you, you'll forgive me for, for talking a lot about the dictionary. I, I, I think it's a great, it, it's one of the great things in, in modern Judaism. Um, he wanted to prove, and he would have wanted to prove, and he did prove, that was the thing. The dictionary does prove that Hebrew was never a dead language, that was always inventing new words in the Middle Ages, in the, uh, in, in the ancient period, in the modern period, before him, his own work, after him, everything. Um, 
always inventing new words. It was always also inventing new meanings for old words, which is another way that a language changes and lives and, and remains, remains um, useful and, 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 and lively. And I'm going to give just one example. Just one example of a of a word. Um, it's a common enough word, ner, in Hebrew. Ner and uh, ner are, uh, is is a, is a candle in modern Hebrew. Um, when you light candles, those are those are nerots, the plural. Um, that's what it means today, a candle. And it's meant that it took on that new meaning um, about. 1500 or 1600, right? Hundreds of years ago when European Jews started using candles, apparently. Um, in the Bible, it never means a candle. It, uh, all, it, it always means an oil lamp. Right? An air in, 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 in the Bible is an oil lamp. In the Middle Ages, also an oil lamp. Um, in modern Hebrew, it's the opposite. If you, if you, if you say an air, you mean a candle. If you want to say an oil lamp, you have to use a different word today because the meanings have, have switched. Um, and all of this is in, is in Ben Yehuda's dictionary, right? And, and he follows it up. Um, but, but there's also much more, because, because even in the Bible, as he, as he shows, um, I mean, ner means a lamp, he said, an oil lamp. Um, but it doesn't just mean a physical lamp. Right? It doesn't just mean the, uh, you know, the pottery gadget that, that, that holds the oil. Um, it means a light. Um, in the same way that when we say a light, we we mean you know we mean the bulb. We also we mean the, the glass part of the bulb. We mean also the incandescent part in the middle bulb, and it's called a light, right? So also in the Bible, um, um, it doesn't mean a candle specifically, but it means means a light, and it was used metaphorically, and and then he gets to the Middle Ages, and I, I think this is really really beautiful. I I, I love this. Um, uh, in the Middle Ages, the Milky Way, right? You know, this stars in the sky. Um, the the Milky Way um, was uh, apparently called uh, Ner Hashemayim, right? Uh, ben Yehuda worked his way through thousands and thousands of Hebrew books, noting down all of the words that they used and, and the meanings that they gave to them. And among other books that he looked at were books about uh, astronomy that were written in Hebrew in the Middle Ages, of which there are a surprising number. There are actually quite a few. Um, and in those books, um, they're talking about the Milky Way and they call it uh, Ner Hashemayim, the lamp of heaven. It's, it's really nice, you know? Isn't that nice? Right? The lamp of heaven. Um, but it's not just like a, you know, it's not just like a chocolate bar, right? Um, in, uh, in in Israel today, it's called Shviel Hachalav, which means you know, way of milk, just like in English. Um, but in the Middle Ages, Ner Hashemayim, the lamp of heaven, and all kinds of beautiful things like this in in in, in Ben Yehuda's dictionary. It's it's a wonderful wonderful resource. Um, even today, a hundred years later, um, it's you know it's out of date, obviously. Um, it doesn't you know it doesn't cover the last hundred years of Hebrew, but uh, but for all of the thousands of years of Hebrew before that, um, it's, it's, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it at all. Um, and Gratz's own particular copy of the dictionary also has a story, which I'll talk about briefly. Um, it uh, was a gift from the Chomsky family, from William and Elsie Chomsky. William and Elsie taught uh, Hebrew at Gratz for almost 50 years. They, they started in the 20s. They uh, were still teaching in the 60s, the 1960s. Um, uh, they're famous, to the extent that they're famous, it's on account of their son, Willie, uh, Noam Chomsky, who's also in the picture. Uh, Noam, Noam Chomsky, right, the, the famous activist and, and linguist at MIT, most famous graduate of Gratz, I think, Gratz class of uh, 47 or 48, something like that. Um, but his parents, as I said, taught Hebrew at Gratz, and they were they were the heart and soul of Gratz College for you know for decades in the, in, in the middle of uh, of the twentieth century. And and I find it moving, right? The, the Chomsky family, apparently, or somebody anyway, um, you know, spent years collecting all of the volumes. The the, the, the dictionary the dictionary started coming out. The first volume of the dictionary, Aleph. 
right? Um, the first volume of the dictionary came out in 1909. And I don't know if the Chomsky's bought volume one in 1909, they were kind of young then, but you know, they, they, they picked it up in the 20s or the 30s, at which point uh, Benny Huda had passed away. He died in 1922. Um, and they were up to like volume eight or volume nine um, by that time. And then, and and his his uh, Ben Yehuda's wife, Emda Ben Yehuda, um, picked up the uh, project, and she worked on it until she passed away in 1951. At which point they were in at like volume 14, and the last volume, the last volume of the dictionary didn't appear. Right, the volume with with Shin and Taf, the last two letters of the uh, uh, of the Hebrew alphabet, didn't appear until 1959, 50 years after after they started publishing it. It took 50 years and somebody, again, maybe the Chomskys, was out there collecting the volumes one by one, waiting patiently right, for the whole thing to appear. Um, the whole, again, the whole project was just, 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 just an, an enormous labor, a labor of love, really a labor of love. Um, now, I said that Ben Yehuda is called the father of modern Hebrew, and he's also the father of modern spoken Hebrew. Um, the story, it's a famous story, but it is, it is a true story, um, is that uh, he took an oath when he got to Palestine and when he got to Jerusalem in 1882, he took a sacred oath um, uh, that when he was at home, he would never speak any language except Hebrew. And so his family grew up speaking Hebrew, um, and his family were the first family, as far as we know, that spoke Hebrew at home um, for, uh, for, for 2,000 years. Um, which brings me finally to my last, my last treasure. Um, I'm running out of time, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to get this in quickly. Um, this is an amazing book. I, I, I don't want to skip it. It's, 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 it's an utterly amazing book. Of all the books that I've found in the Gratz Library, by far the most, it's, it's, it's astonishing that Gratz has a copy, and, and it's amazing that the book exists at all, that it was ever published. Um, it's called Hagina, which means the garden, uh, which refers here to kindergarten. Um, and... Uh, and, and if you can imagine it, right, in, in in Ukraine, this was published in Ukraine, it was published in Odessa. There were kindergartens, it was a new idea, but they had them. Um, there were Jewish kindergartens. There were Jewish kindergartens where they were teaching Hebrew as a spoken language, right? where the language of the of the classroom was Hebrew, Hebrew kindergartens where the where the the uh, the kindergarten teacher, the Ganenet, as she's called in Hebrew, um, would speak Hebrew and the kids would would try to answer in Hebrew. Um, Hebrew kindergartens, and then the the Ghana note, the, the 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 kindergarten teachers had a professional association, which is just again astonishing if you know anything about kindergarten teachers these days who, who do not have a professional organization by and large. Um, but in in Ukraine, they apparently had a the Hebrew kindergarten teachers had a professional organization, and they had a professional. If you can imagine, they had a professional journal that they brought out in Hebrew. Okay, and if all of that wasn't just kind of Extraordinary enough, they did this in 1918 and in 1919. And if you know your history, 1918 is the last year of World War I, and it is the year after the Russian Revolution. Uh, it is the first year of the Russian Civil War. 1919 was the height of the Russian Civil War, and it was the year when there were pogroms up and down Ukraine. And in the middle of all these pogroms, in the middle of all of this chaos and violence, there were these women, um, they were mostly women, mostly young married, young unmarried women, um, running their kindergarten classes in Hebrew, teaching the little boys and girls how to speak Hebrew there in Ukraine. Um, Hebrew became a spoken language in Israel, first on kibbutzim and, and then later on in the cities and later on, uh, there's a whole country who speak uh, Hebrew. But it started out as a spoken language in um, in Eastern Europe in schools, in schools like these 
Hebrew kindergartens, um, and also in American schools, um, like in Graz, where uh, where they were teaching Hebrew um, and speaking Hebrew, not just reading it; they were also speaking it. Um, and you know, I I, I said that that writers like um, you know like Moses, Marcus, Philip are forgotten, but but truly, truly forgotten are these heroes of uh, of the rebirth of Hebrew, the, the, these kindergarten teachers in in in, uh, in Ukraine, like Mrs. Martyr, who taught Hebrew kindergarten in Kiev. They, they give a whole list. There are like seventy five of them. Um, N. Spivak in Melitopol, um, K. Horovich in 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 Kharkiv, where the fighting was last year, and and so on and so on. Um, an amazing, amazing group. Um, and this is their, this is truly their 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 only memorial, and their only uh, their only trace that they have left is this volume. Um, I actually have it have it here, um, right? I have it here at home. Um, this this volume of their professional journal, Agina. So those are my five treasures. Um, the David Levy Pentateuch, the uh, Avat Sion, the first Hebrew novel, um, Moses Phillips' book about the telegraph, Ben Yehuda's dictionary, Agina by the Union of Hebrew Kindergarten Teachers of Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you for taking part in this uh, in, in in this day of learning um, and this learnathon. Um, if anybody wants to uh, be in touch with me. I, I would love to, to hear from any of you. Thank you very much. Uh, and bye-bye. Uh,